It's 11 o'clock on Sunday night. Are you naked? Well, put some clothes on before the cops pull you over. But keep it tuned to AM 1240 WGBB Freeport, because Dave's Gone By starts right now. <laughs> Greetings from Long Island, where every highway is a sunrise. It's time for Dave's Gone By, an hour of comedy, talk, and music brought to you by Total Theater, with your host, Dave Lefkowitz. You've never heard anything like it, so sit back, relax. Real if you must. Here's the host of Dave's Gone By, Dave! Tropical hot dog night! Rush to the main of a fruit bite! Every cover of day! Swirling around at night! Well, there goes the day! Hood. Welcome, everybody. Welcome on this Sunday night, May 4th, 2008, to the 271st episode of Dave's Gone By, here on AM 1240 WGBB Freeport. Happy to be here with you. Happy to be here with my guest co-host, Jeffrey Goodman. Hey, oh, it Jeff. seems like just last week we're doing number 270. Well, you know, seven days goes by, go by. And it goes by if you're if you're in a cockney sort of mode, and then it's two seventy one. So so, what's what's your numerical thing that you want to uh, say about that? You normally have some kind Actually, of. I think uh, it's a prime number. Nothing times not something will will well, equal divisible seven. by three. Okay. So it's not you know if you add the numbers and they're divisible by three, then it's divisible by three. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay, it's not. So maybe nine. Well, no. If it's not divisible, then it won't be divisible by nine. No. Couldn't be a five. Couldn't be an uh, even a, maybe a seven somewhere. I don't know. Two mm, seventy? No, it couldn't be because nine times it'd be. Well, anyway, I don't care. I just don't care. Anyway, what I do care about it actually was I wasn't actually talking about numeric things, but you just, you know. I just let you roll with that. Yeah, thank you so much. Anyway, what we are rolling with here on WGBB on Dave's Gone By is comedy, talk radio, music, interviews, all sorts of cool stuff that we've been doing since October 2002. And tonight is no different because we have a special, well, two special guests, actually, not counting special guest co-host Jeff Goodman. Well, because I'm just not special. No, no, no. You know, we're so used to <laughs> I'm like to you. ordinary. Yeah, you're furniture at this point. <laughs> you're like, oh, oh, there's something near the... What's near the... Oh, it's you. <laughs> oh, I thought it was just a big fluffy sofa. That's right, yeah. A love seat. A love oh. cushion. Yeah. A seat of love. Well, I'm, actually, I'm not going there. But anyway, <laughs> don't know what that means. Never been there, never will. <laughs> so, Rabbi Saul Solomon of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York, will be appearing on our show tonight. He comes here about once a month, usually to do an interview. And yes, tonight he has another interview of a Yiddish kite sort of a bent to, uh, to do tonight, even though, oddly enough, ironically enough, the subject of his interview is moving a little bit away from Yiddish and Jewish matters in her latest endeavor. Oh, no. Rabbi Saul Solomon will be talking to actress and singer Eleanor Risa, now, uh, you may have seen her on TV. She's done a law and order here and there. More likely, if Everyone's you're a theater person. Law and order. Well, yeah, but you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't go, oh, that's the Eleanor Risa episode. <laughs> it's just, you know, maybe if she was a victim. I don't think she was a corpse or anything. She was probably just a distraught Jewish person. Oh, they have those every now. Every year they do some Jewish themed thing, and the, the Jews are so sort of stereotypical. They all wear oh, the yeah. yarmulkes, they all have little accents, and they're all like, hey, I, how, da, 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 you know. And one of them is usually guilty. We don't know if I was carrying six million dollars worth of diamonds. Well, that, that's the Linda Lavin one. Or, or the, and that was, they got Arya Gross, Linda Lavin, and I don't know who else they get. Edward James Olmos, maybe. <laughs> or else they got to play a Jew on Law and Order. But anyway, she if she was on Law and Order, she'd probably play, play a Jew. But <laughs> she certainly played Jews on Broadway because she was Tony nominated for directing on the Broadway show Those Were the Days. Kind of came out of nowhere, this little bitty show about Yiddish theater that came from the public theater. And it was about the great songs and memories of Yiddish theater with songs and dances. When was it on Broadway? 1989, I believe it was. Really? Well, you know, 
when the rabbi talks to Eleanor, he'll he'll be asking her all oh, about man. that. So anyway, kind of cool. We have a Tony nominee on the show, and it's she. And Rabbi Sal Solomon will be talking to her because Eleanor Risa is going to be at the Metropolitan Room. That's a, a cool cabaret room in New York on West 22nd Street. And she's doing three consecutive weeks there on, on one night a week. Eleanor sings in English. So, ironically, she's not doing any Yiddish stuff right now, but the rabbi will be talking to her anyway. He won't hold it against her. And the whole interview will be in English, or will there be some Yiddish? I think she may sprinkle in a phrase here and there of uh, Yiddish, Polish, and... Uh, and how about the rabbi? Does he speak Yiddish? He barely speaks English. The rabbi just grunts and mumbles, and then pretty much you have to play your way if you're the person he's interviewing. you got to just go with it. But she's, uh, she's a good sport, and I think it, it'll come out really, really well. So Eleanor Risa talking to the rabbi tonight on Dave's Gone By. And then Jeff and I shall be chatting about Broadway, more specifically. Well, thank goodness. Broadway. It's been a long time. Well, yeah, because we haven't had time. We've had guests who, um, who took up, like, the whole show or other things to do, or I was away or you were away. So now, tonight, well, we were both at the Broadway. same time. It was called Passover. Yeah, that, that one night we were... We were both gone, and then, then there were various different reasons. But tonight on Inside Broadway, among the things we will be discussing are the new musical Cry Baby, based on the John Waters film. Both Jeff and I have seen the Broadway musical based on Cry Baby, and we're going to weigh in on it. We also want to talk about Sunday in the Park with George. This is a revival of the great Stephen Sondheim and James Lapine musical. The great work. Jeff and I have been wanting to talk about this for weeks, oh, and we God. have not had the time. Finally, we're going to get to it, and um, maybe one or two other things as well, plus a little bit of Broadway news as well on Inside Broadway. So it's going to be a fun, again, kind of a theatery inside, um, a theatery Dave's gone by tonight. I've had complaints over the years sometimes from people who say, oh, you know, it's supposed to be a comedy show, it's supposed to be an interview show, and then you just do too much theater stuff. Too much, you're a theater geek, and the rest of the world doesn't care so much. Why do you do so much theater? And I take it to heart, but this time of year, it's so close. The Tony nominations are coming out in one week. Um, you know, the, Tuesday is the last day of the Broadway season. Yeah. With, with the last show, uh, Glory Days, a new musical that came out of nowhere to fill up Circle in the Square Theater. When that opens, that's it. That's the end of the 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008 Broadway season. And then a week later, the Tony nominations are announced, and then three more weeks, and it's the Tony Awards. So this is the time. It's really kind of unavoidable. And there's also another reason. Why is that? We are theater geeks, therefore we talk about theater yeah. a lot. Incessantly, insanely. And there's a third reason, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to push it now. We're going to be pushing it from now until mid-June. Mm-hmm. Why is that? I'm not going to give a drum roll. I'm going to give a a sparkling fruits water gargle. Hold on. That's disgusting. Thank you. June 14th, ladies and gentlemen, 7.30 oh. p.m. to 10 p.m. on this very radio station, AM 1240, right WGBB. So don't turn your dial between now and June 14th. That's right. Keep it here. Just, just we take a soldering gun and, and make sure in your car radio, in your regular radio, you just solder... The little pointer on your radio to 1240 on okay. your AM dial. It's all electronic now. You don't have to stop. There's, no, there's nothing all right. So then, then, then get your eight-year-old who's computer literate to fix it so that you can't move your dial <laughs> from 1240 AM because on June 14th, we will be having the fourth annual WGBB Tony Awards Special hosted by... <laughs> myself, because I founded the darn thing four years ago, and Jeff Goodman will be with me in studio as a big co-host. I hosted the first one, too. And the first, well, you hosted all of them, haven't you? Co-hosted? Oh, yeah. yeah. Last year it was you, me, and Simon Saltzman, who is the that president of, of the uh, the Outer Critics Circle. Simon will be joining us by telephone, but he won't be in studio this year. And then we have the loving, cur lovely cursing lady on the phone. Well, no, we, we will not be having her this year. <laughs> <laughs> we will have in the studio one of the, made, probably the most feared, but most read theater people really? in New York, which also means in America, Michael Riedel, the columnist of the New York Post. He's, his column appears Wednesdays and Fridays, and every person in who has any interest in theater reads his column, devours it word to word. So you must be scared of him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's the man. 
in theater. And he's also on TV every uh, late Friday night on Theater Talk on PBS. So Michael Regal, though, will be with us in studio on the WGBB 4th Annual Tony Awards special. Mark your calendars, people. And Charles Gross will probably call in. Charlie will probably call in. I hope so. June 14th, 7.30 to 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. It'll be not just talk. We will play show tunes. We've got um, music to play from such new shows as Xanadu, In the Heights, Young Frankenstein, plus um, ho hoping to get some music also from Passing Strange. I think you'll probably get it from Crybaby as well. Hopefully. It, it's I. You know, I haven't. Maybe it's in your mailbox. It isn't in mine, but I haven't gotten that. There's a couple of things I would love to have. You know, there was a a CD of Sunday in the Park with George with the, the English cast members back when it was done at the Don Mara Warehouse or the, the Chocolate Company Warehouse. But I can't find it. My library doesn't have it. And until they do a new cast CD, I can't get those people well, doing their thing. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I, actually, I should. I will. Because I would love you to hear Gemma, Jenna Russell and Daniel Evans doing the songs of Sunday in the Park. Mm -hmm. But anyway, all I'm saying is show tunes quizzes i've got great giveaway you know i'm telling you now we're going to be giving away a pair of tickets to opening night of the boyfriend of the broad hollow theater cool stuff plus a packet of material from young frankenstein and the broadway revival of gypsy all of this is going to be part of the wgb we'll go try and get uh, some broadway tickets I'll do my best, but I'm not guaranteed. I don't want to make the whole show about giveaways and prizes. We already have three of them. Okay. What I want is to have a fun show with a lot of critics weighing in on who they think will win and who they think might not win and what deserves to win. We'll talk to a couple of Tony nominees, just like we did last um, last year. <clears throat> we talked to Rebecca Luker, the lovely actress who's still in Mary Poppins. And we talked to um, Her the, husband. the guy who directed... Well, that was the year before. We talked to Danny Burstein. Who is now in South Pacific? He yeah. plays uh, Lieutenant um, Luther Luther Billis, as we plays. He's not cable. Oh, he's not cable. Okay. Um, and also the choreographer Bill T. Jones. We talked to him for yeah. Spring Awakening, and he won. He yeah. won the Tony. So it's good luck to appear on the WGBB Tony Award Special. Now let's talk. Just before we bring in the rabbi and Eleanor Risa, let's just talk a little bit about where the rabbi was last night. Where was the where in the world was the rabbi last night? Well, he was in Massapequa, of all places. His usual temple, the temple that he is at, Temple Sons of Bitches, is in Great Neck, New York. But he was at Temple Judea last night because they were having their Wild West-themed Silver Shekel Saloon. And he was asked to appear as kind of a personality. He was a shiny star, the Silver Shekel. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. He was also asked to do some of that cat skill kind of thing of uh, marrying people quote-unquote, when you take two completely unsuitable people or suitable people and you fake marry them with a fake marriage contract and a ceremony and there was a cantor there who was dressed like sort of fat, balding Elvis. Schmelvis. He called himself Schmelvis. He had fake sideburns and big dark glasses and he had a nice voice and so he'd sing this cute little funny song during the ceremony and so well, how did you like the whole uh, silver shekel evening? I had a fine time. Good. Yeah, I mean, you were running like one of the blackjack tables. You were. Uh, I was running the poker blackjack table. You're basically skimming all the money that the the Actually, school was trying to make. Was, there was no money played at our table because the people at the silver shekel forgot to give us shekels. You're kidding me! So I might just play with shekel. Oh, that's nice. We we played for free, so I played with the rabbi. <laughs> no, you wait. The rabbi wasn't there. My rabbi. Yeah. The rabbi of the temple wasn't there. Wasn't yes, he? he was. Where was he? He was making the chili. He, he made it. I thought he made it at home, and then they brought it in. No, the rabbi was sitting at my table for about an hour or so, and then how he you was introduce the me to the rabbi? How could you not? Uh, or you uh, weren't around. Or how could how could you not introduce Rabbi Saul to the rabbi? He saw the cantor. The cantor was the, the cantor was playing piano. You didn't, didn't even go talk to the, the cantor. Songs. Well, yeah, because he was busy. He was kind of like I don't know. It just didn't feel right. But uh, oh, there, there could have been a meeting of the mind. We could have solved. The Israeli-Palestinian crisis last night. Two rabbis putting their heads together. But no, one rabbi was busy making chili. <laughs> <laughs> and well, that's gonna, I think that's going to solve the Palestinian problem right there. Well, you're getting, I, think that, I, I think we could solve the whole Middle East crisis in two words. What? Vegetarian, Vegetarian chili. chili. I think so, too. Mm. Mm. But only if you poison the Arab portion. But anyway, 
That's something the rabbi That's would say. Mean. I know. But I'm a mean kind of a guy. Anyway, so the rabbi came and he did a little he did a little five, ten minute shtick, talked to some people in the audience. He made fun of the fact that Temple Judea, no matter how much they're raising, still gonna close. Yeah, right. And and you were the one who pointed out that Judea just sold its building or is in, in contract to do that. It's gonna make three point five million dollars and it's merging. What well, the hell did they point, make, need to be They're raising? not making three point five million dollars oh. either. There's, there's, I don't know what the building oh, sold dead. for. Oh, okay. I just picked the number out of my head. Got it. Got it. So, um, so I, I just was telling, telling you, they make millions. Of, it was my way of saying, oh, it's millions of dollars. All right, well, whatever they made. So why, why are they holding a benefit for a synagogue that's actually closing? I'm I wondering where that money is going and who's going to uh, the Cayman Islands with it. I, I don't, well, I don't know. The cancer doesn't seem to be returning. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. He took his keyboard. And he's on a one-way flight he left somewhere. The building. Yeah. Maybe they put it on the bottom of the chili. Because at the end, there was so much food left over. Everybody was walking away with, with trays of watermelon and hot dogs and chicken. Maybe there were like thousand dollar bills. Bills underneath. Yeah. It was, I'm, just, I'm just going off with the brownies. Uh, hot dogs. <laughs> anyway. Wrapped in a million dollar bun. Oh, if only. Anyway, we've got a million dollar show for you here tonight on Dave's Gone By. We've got the rabbi and Eleanor Risa coming up and then inside Broadway after that. Please, folks. Oh, my gosh. Guess what I forgot to do? Oh, our sponsors. Very quickly. Thank you, thank you to our wonderful sponsors, which include... Um, fancy Schmancy Balloons, because I can't think of anyone else right now. And it also includes Dave's Wonderful Magazine. Performing Arts Insider. The Bible of Broadway. Go to PerformingArtsInsider.com to find out more. Rock.com. MortgagesRock.com. MortgagesRock.com. And... We feel it, Minuteman Press. The Copy Kings of Broadway. 1315 to, Broadway. Next to the soon-to-be-closed Loman Shoes. In Hewlett, New York. 10% off at Mulet Minuteman Press. And then there's that food store. Nava. European and Russian Groceries, 1239 Broadway in Hewlett. Look for Stephen and ask him for food from Israel. Ask him for things like pickles and yogurts and kefir and pastas from all and over. And ask him for free Europe. food. See what he says. Well, I'll give you a taste of something. A little, a little taste something, of. something, yeah. And he's open seven days a week. So check out Nava Groceries. So Nava closed. Bum, bum, Never change the radio dial when Dave's Gone By is on because we have great programs. But where was he located? I, I didn't get that. I, I said it was 1239 Broadway. In what? Hewlett. It's, it's two blocks away from the Loman Shoe Store that's closing and from Hewlett Minuteman Press. Maybe we can get them to move into the Loman Shoe Store. Oh, Wouldn't yeah. that be great? That's a lot of space for a bunch of pickles. and <laughs> for, for Oh, really? Well, yeah, oh, well you, you know the size of that shoe store. Oh, it's enormous. That's right. they got to get either a really giant restaurant in there or something else. Fancy schmancy blue. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, balloons take up a lot of space, need a lot of room. I'll go in with the Neva Foods. How's that? How's that? All right. You go. Neva. Bring them in there. Neva. N-E-V-A. Groceries. I love those Middle Eastern foods. Terrific. All the pistachios. Um, I know they have nuts. And... Uh, <laughs> oh, I am so not going there. But let's go nuts together on this edition of Dave's Gamba. Do you know who pays for this wonderful program? Not the radio station, not the government, not even the vicious comedy elves. No, the people who keep Dave's Gone By going are the sponsors and the listeners. People getting their message across to Dave's audience. Your advertising dollars can support every show, while at the same time bringing Dave's listeners to your restaurant, your travel agency, your yogurt shop, whatever. And if you don't think advertising on Dave's Gone By is effective, a certain theater magazine, mortgage company, and copy shop would surely beg to differ. So, try a half-minute ad for half a year, or a full-minute ad for a whole year. Either way, you will become part of the Dave's Gone By family. A strange, dysfunctional family, but a family nonetheless. See the rate card at davesgoneby.org or email davesgoneby at aol.com and they will be in touch.
went to London just to ride that pony. I am, I am, I am, I do the road. I am, so Columbus, sing to the last of the time. Shalom, damn it all, oh, I'm so happy, I'm so excited, and I'm dwelling as I usually am when I am on the radio with you, my friends, and my enemies, but especially my friends, because I get to be here and share the joys of Jewishness and Yiddishkeit with all of you. Now, I could sit here at the microphone and talk by myself, to myself, for hours. In fact, I have done this, and this is why I am in therapy, but it's even better when I am talking to someone who is talented and beautiful and wonderful and also filled with the joys of Yiddishkeit. And I have such a person with me on the telephone. Her name is Eleanor Risa, and she is a cabaret singer and a performer and an actress and a director and a choreographer and a bricklayer. Amazing stuff. Eleanor, shalom and welcome. Welcome to the neighborhood. Shalom, shalom, Rabbi. Glad to talk to you. Glad to talk you too. So, Eleanor, how did you wind your way into the ways of Yiddish kite and performance and theater and art? Uh, it's a long story. It started back... Now, I, I've been involved in theater for a long time, Rabbi. Yes. Um, my parents actually were Holocaust survivors, so Yiddish was my first language. I'm working on English. I hope it's coming along okay. Look, wait, um, already um, there's a strange assumption there, if I may. Why is it so natural that they, you would be a Yiddish speaker? They would be. Wouldn't they be German or wouldn't they be Hebrew? Uh, no. No. No, Rabbi. Uh, most, or many, I don't know most or anything, but many, they were Polish Jews, my family, and they spoke Yiddish. They weren't uh, German Jews. They were Polish uh, Jews. Okay. So Yiddish was spoken at home and... Uh, it, you know, it was a gorgeous language. It's my first language. And uh, from there, I threw myself into the Yiddish theater. When I could, I did Yiddish. Uh, it, it was near and dear to me. Um, because in school, you, you did Our Town, and you did other, <laughs> you, quote, unquote, not Jewish plays, but normal plays. Normal, right? normal plays of all nationalities, yes. And I do that still, and, and most of my career has been that. Um, but I know this in your, your resume and your biography. You actually at one point had a role in the play The Horrors of Dr. Moreau. That was my first play. Tell the people what you played. I, I played the very, very unkosher role of the pig woman. Hey, hey, <laughs> Ashanda and Abisha. Oh, did you have to dress up as a little piggy? I did, I did. I, I was a little porker and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a great play, actually. Uh, fellow Joel Stone wrote it, but it was the first play I ever did outside of oh. in the world of off off Broadway. It was based on H.G. Wells, The Island of Dr. Oh. Moreau. You see, you should have done The Island of Dr. Moreau a bit, <laughs> and you would have gotten into the Yiddish type much, much quicker. It worked out. It thank did. the Lord I had a, a little bit of time before I did that. So, how did you morph? from going from off off Broadway into doing uh, more mainstream productions? Uh, just luck, just good fortune and, uh, you know, working, scratching my way up uh, or over or down. Uh, well, that's what I do in the shower, but we need to <laughs> yeah, talk about that. Yeah, but we do that in show business, too. Um, one thing led to another, one recommendation to another. Um, I started, I, I didn't sing originally when I 
first got into the business, I didn't really know that I could sing. And um, because my mother was very critical and always said that I twitch it, which is a, a word for squawking. And, uh, is that related to kvetch? It's kind of related to kvetch, but it's more melodic. Oh, kvetch! Like that. Kind of. And uh, so anyway, so I started singing and uh, started doing musicals, started doing comedy, straight plays. Uh, one thing just led to the next. I mean, it was kind of great. And uh, You worked in the Catskills, didn't you? I was a waitress. <laughs> oh, my goodness. When was this? Or roughly when? Uh, a long time ago. <laughs> well, you're not that. Come on. Was it the 70s or the I, 80s? I, 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 it's so hard to remember, uh, Rabbi. Yeah, 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 yeah. The numbers. I'm so bad. I mean, I started out as a math major at Brooklyn College, but I'm so bad with numbers. Oh, sure. No, it's okay. I know some, some people. I know some women that so old they babysat red buttons. Oh, my goodness. Old. Oh, my God. <laughs> they sat behind Henny Youngman in Hebrew school. This is old. No, but I'm kidding. I'm That's all right. Joking. But, so, but was it still the heyday of the Catskills? It, it was kind of a heyday. And, uh, you know, not, not a, it was a different from when Jerry Lewis was there and all that. It was, uh, but it was very young and happening. And oh. there was a lot of, uh, it was a lot of fun. It, it was uh, kind of the last gasp of the Catskills is when I was there. At the, I worked at the Homoac Hotel and at the Evans Hotel. Oh, and Homoac, the, oh, yes. You know, um, it, 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 was, it was a good time. It was hard work. It, it put me through college, frankly. I went to every weekend of the year. I drove up, waited tables, made a couple of hundred bucks, Ooh, and uh, nice. went back to Brooklyn College <laughs> for $53 a semester, uh, and it was worth every penny, Rabbi. Those were the days, let me tell you. Yeah. Did you meet, uh, like so many did there, uh, did you meet your husband uh, now in the Catskills times? Or? No, 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 no. I, I met my husband a blind date uh, much, much later. Oh, oh, well. So, so yeah. Nice but, Jewish boy? Uh, I'm afraid so. Oh. <laughs> well, I, mean, I like him anyway. Oh, did you go for the bad boys when you were uh, in your team? I was, uh, you know, I was open. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> I, I don't know how to interpret that, but uh, I'd, like, I'd certainly like to. No, but, uh, open to boys and girls or just boys or what? No, just, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting world. Did um, you date out of the faith? Everybody had faith. We all uh, had faith that the guys would be okay. <laughs> That was my uh, my primary faith. With, uh, you have a secondary <laughs> degree in vagueness. Or, uh, there. Date what? <laughs> no, I'm saying you 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 earned a secondary degree in vagueness with okay. your answers there. <laughs> in less vagueness. Oh. Less vagueness. Yeah, you're punning there with. Well, you are punning with Eleanor Risa, the actress, the director, the choreographer. Let us now move to 1989. A perfectly nice year. What happened in 1989, Rabbi? Like, isn't that the year that uh, you had? Uh, um, oh no, no, it was. No, it could be. I mean, it could be 89. I just. Uh, no, that was when you really first started going into also behind the scenes stuff with with the directing, directing choreography. Yes, yes. But it wasn't. I, I was. Uh, I think. Uh, Thinking about 1990 or 91, I, I myself. When was those were the days? That's um, funny. You know. It, the goofy thing is, those were the days I think started it in, in either in '89 or '90, and ah. it was just supposed to be a three-week run in Philadelphia, and uh, it wound up, you know, earning me a Tony nomination. Can, can you describe what those were the days was? It was a Yiddish English um, uh, 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 road. Down, like it was like the best of. It was like the best of every joke and every tune, and and it was five performers, and the five performers were the best of. I mean, there was, you know, in my opinion, it, it you know, Bruce Adler, oh. Lena Byrne, uh, Bob Abelson, Laurie Wilmer, and myself, and the five of us were able to evoke a world not yet gone by, but yet full of terrific memories and it wasn't done in a kind of sh it was it wasn't done in a schmaltzy boring way it was done alive and uh, exciting it was very but you know it, it was the year of the first iraq war when we went to broadway so it was a rough uh, business you know they were sending scuds to israel oh, yeah. at that time and it was um that's what you know there were a lot of jews going out to the theater, but but it did pretty well. It could have done better if 
times were better. And um, and you you came out pretty well from I it because you were well Tony nominated. Tony nominated. Uh, Bruce Adler was also Tony nominated, and and I was uh, shockingly nominated as well. Shockingly, that was because of your talent thing. It was a fun show. It was, but it, it was such a surprise. You know what I mean? It was such a surprise to be recognized um, in that community. Uh, it, it was, <laughs> you know, it was great. But it was, it was, it was. You know, when I the mm. press agent that day called me and he said, um, "Listen, I want to tell you that Bruce." You know, the Tony announcements were announced, and Bruce Adler was nominated, and, and I had bet Bruce a hundred bucks, which I still owe him, that he would be nominated. And I, I said, wow, that's, you know, I was very excited for Bruce. And then he said, you're nominated, too. Whoa. And I said, for what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, because, I mean, I directed it, choreographed it, and was in it. And I thought, well, what was the category? And he, and he said direction. And I, I just, uh, you know, my blood sort of stopped and went in the other direction. And um, it was kind of, uh, it was really... Mine does that every week. I take a pill. And yeah, then it, yeah. It yeah, this was, this was yeah. without any medication. So, did it change your career? Did it open doors? No. Or? No, I said, no. <laughs> no. No, it didn't do that much. Um, I'm, it didn't. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why it didn't, but um, it didn't. Um, you know, it's funny being a Jew. You know, Yiddish and Jewish, you know, is it a good thing? Does it improve one's career? It, does it marginalize you? Or, you know, so it's unclear if, if, uh, if it does. You know, people start putting you in a in a in a pigeonhole and uh that's why this that's why i'm doing this cabaret thing uh at the metropolitan room called eleanor Risa sings english explain it well i mean you know i work i mean i've worked in the theater for the you know for so long and in english in yiddish but yiddish is such a kind of catch-all thing you know that it's so memorable that People think that I don't speak English. <laughs> they don't. They, they well, right, you know, what are you doing? What are you do? What's doing with the Jewish theater? What's doing with the Yiddish thing? I said, well, I, I don't really know. I'm working. You know, I just directed How to Succeed in Business in White Plains, and I don't really know what's happening with the Yiddish theater at the moment. You know, they, so people just think. That's what you That's do. What you're I do. On that. Now, let me. It is fair for people to assume that you have um, even a stronger connection to the Yiddish theater because you got involved with the Folkspina, yes. the oldest, currently uh, still extant yes. Yiddish theatrical organization in America. Yeah. So you were first you were acting and, and doing stuff with them, and then you got even more deeply involved. Yeah. 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 Uh, I became uh, one of the artistic directors and. Uh, produced there and uh... But, but, but I'm going to stay with you. I mean, those were tough times. I mean, you had the old guard that was trying to hang on to the way things were done in the old days and to do what they wanted to do. But then they realized, hey, this this boy has no money and we're going to crash, so we need to do something else. So you, was it you and Zalman Malopek? Yeah. yeah. So you guys came in, and was there a, a big power struggle or anything like that? You no. Know, um, the woman who had run the folks being a four Lord knows how many years, was still a vital, uh, excited, exciting woman. And yes, I know, I've dated her. And, and she didn't, didn't really want to hand over the reins. And I under, you know, I wouldn't want to either. Right. I mean, you, ha you know, the reins, I mean, being king even of a poor country is better than not being king. So I I understand and it, and it was it was a, it, somewhat difficult but and I have uh, regrets in a way currently about how um, it was handled you, you know one person wants to go to move for you know a younger person wants to move forward and climb up the ladder but somebody's sitting on the ladder and they don't want to get off That's the ladder right. so it's a fight on the ladder but uh, and then the person on top starts to pee pee down the ladder and yeah. then it really gets ugly but yeah so, so but you were what I don't understand is okay so 
you and, and Malotech were artistic directors, and she went off to try and found a separate yes. organization, which yes. nothing, they did one play, and obviously they, they didn't really... They did one play that... It, did well. It, did, it, got, it got very critical, it got critically acclaimed, and they made a little film. Did you see it? I didn't see the film. It was the time. really nice. It was, it was really a, a nice film about, you know, with no dough, with no nothing, just will. You know, very survivorish kind of will she and 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 those she, that 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 helped her. They really, they really wanted it. And and uh, when I saw the film, I I felt bad. I felt bad about it. But how come you are no longer co-artistic director of the Fox Um I mean, she was not in the picture anymore. It was, you know, it was, it was me, you and Zalman Love. It was me and Zalman. Um, it, you know, it, it was uh, just time to... I think having two kings is really a hard <laughs> thing. You, you know, most countries don't have two kings. They have one king. And, and two kings... You know, is is difficult or can be uh, yeah. difficult. And but then again, theaters now have they have an artistic director, a producing director, and a managing director, and an executive producer. So that's right. That's they could right. have taken. But, yeah. But we were both sort of uh, kind of doing the same job ah. in a way, I ish. And so uh, I think um, so. I exited uh, because uh, it was. Um, it was, you know, I had other things to do and other things I wanted to do, and um, I'm happy for them and a friend of the folks being Good. there and like oh, that. Oh, so it's amicable on that level. Yes, that's absolutely, open. absolutely. Right. But it was just, you know, it was, it was, it just, uh, beca it was just difficult. And and the folks being had, we had really done some good work, and it was an okay time to exit. Um, and you also started to do more playwriting, I think. I, yeah, I started. Yeah, I was doing. I started playwriting, and um, I started kind of doing different, a different sort of uh, Yiddish act. You know, this hip Hamish and hot thing. Hip Hamish, what is it? A striptease? Yeah, it was kind of like a striptease. It, oh. it went from right to left. But people <laughs> were like, "Put it on! Put it on!" You know, it was like that. It was. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, working with different musicians and just kind of um, expressing my musical Jewiness in a kind of hipper way than I had been, and um, so it, 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 it's it's been you know interesting. Minute Man, the superheroes of photocopying, printing and binding. Minute Man, no job too big or small. Minute Man, family run since 1975. Minute Man, 1315 Broadway in Hewlett, Long Island, next to the new low men's shoe store. Tell them they've sent you for 10% off. Minute Man, hero of our photocopying dreams. Hi, it's Eleanor Lisa uh, of the Yiddish world and the English world and Bizarro world. And I just want to tell you, why don't you listen to Dave's Gone By, WGBB Freeport? Huh? Listen to him. I have two more questions to, to, to ask of the lovely Eleanor Risa here on The Neighborhood. I'm Rabbi Sal Solomon. Very happy to be talking to her. And then uh, thank you so much also for your honesty and for, for going into all these things. I think it's wonderful. Have you ever worked with Mendy Patinkin? <laughs> I have. I, we were we were on the same bill uh, a number oh, of times. How crazy is he? Uh, you know, I don't. It, to me, he was never crazy. You know, oh. so I I, I uh, he never smacked you around. Not yet. Never not yet. But hit you know, with a barbell. No, 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 no. He uh, no. We we enjoyed each other's uh, performance. Really? Oh, this is good. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. It, he was he was terrific, and uh, I haven't seen him for a long time. But he was always kind to me. 
All right, all right. See, it's nice to get two sides of a <laughs> terrible, miserable person. But you know, I no, I can't, I can't. So, and also, one thing I know is you have so many theater credits, and now you're going to get some cabaret credits because you're you're going to be at the Metropolitan Room May eighth, May fifteenth, and May twenty second. Yes, so everyone can see three her. Thursdays in May. So, but I don't see any television or um, or much in the way of movie credit. Listen, you... Rabbi, pray for me, man. <laughs> Do something. Help my career in some fashion. I mean, you know, I have no idea why. I mean, it's a, it's a funny, it's a really funny career. I did many commercials. The camera is very nice to me. I just did a small independent film that went very well. And the puzzle. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, it pays too well and it has too much exposure. Oh, well. So uh, I prefer, you know, the low-paying, low-exposure jobs. Lord knows I do, too. Oh, and, and speaking of which, also, you have a couple of CDs out. So oh, people I who do. pay you to buy those CDs, what are they? Uh, I, I have a CD. Uh, what are my CDs? Uh, I have, wait, I listed songs, songs in the key of Yiddish. Songs in the key of Yiddish and uh, Jem, Ellen Orisa Going Home, Gems of Yiddish Song. And you can get them on my website at uh, eleanorisa.com. And, and you spell that E-L-E-A-N-O-R-R-E-I-S-S-A. -S 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 Bless you, Rabbi. Risa with two S's there. S like, like, like Solomon. Like Solomon, Solomon. that's Solomon. Right. We put our two S's together and that's <laughs> what you have. big <laughs> Exactly. You're, you're ahead of me. You are so sharp, I gotta tell you. Well, um, are you gonna come to the Metropolitan Room, Rabbi? It's, a fr it's not a Friday night. No, it's not a Friday night. I will do it. It's a Thursday night. So, what is it, 7.30? 7.30. Seven, yeah. Everybody go. It's 34 West 22nd Street. It's right off Fifth Avenue, so you can go shopping right before. And, uh, yeah, they have a website, you know, the Metropolitan Room and all this stuff with scheduling and whatever you know, you know all the other stuff that people need to know. Well, my Batamta Eleanor, I thank you so much for Thanks, joining Rabbi, us. Thanks, Rabbi. Any time. Oh, bless you, and good luck. And everybody, go see Eleanor Risa in concert and cabaret as Eleanor sings English, right? Is that good? It's Eleanor Risa sings English, that's right. God bless. You too, Rabbi. seen so many Russian delicacies. Never! Such quality sausage, fish, yogurt, pastries, candy. Never! And do you have to go to Brighton Beach to get it? Never! Never! The new Eastern European Grocery in Hewlett, 1239 Broadway. Open seven days. Look for the Cyrillic on the awning. 516-295-3892. 295-3892. They'll have you Russian back for more. Okay, listen to me. No, I mean listen to me on Compact Disc, where bunches of past episodes of Dave's Gone By are yours to hear over and over again. Comedy sketches like Mel's a Poppin' and Handyman Yoni. Visits with guests like Reckless Eric and Julie Haggerty. Punchlines and politics in the news gone by. All just $11 a disc. Shipping included. Visit davesgoneby.org or call 516-295-1511 for me on CD.
Inside Broadway, brought to you by Total Theater's Performing Arts Insider, your everything theater guide. Yes, thanks to Performing Arts Insider, and find out more about Performing Arts Insider at performingartsinsider.com, because especially because Dave's Gone By listeners get a full year, 12 issues of Performing Arts Insider for only $115. And considering the fact that the regular price for that is 175 that's a pretty darn good deal. It's, a, it's an expensive journal, there's no question about that. But the people who subscribe to Performing Arts Insider love it and rely on it very, very much. Tell me it's excellent. <laughs> yes, the three people who subscribe are all very, very happy with it. <laughs> but anyway, we're very, very happy, of course, that Performing Arts Insider sponsors Inside Broadway, our theater segment. And so first, what we normally do is we talk about the theater news and gossip of the week, and then Jeff and I do some reviewing of theater. So we begin... Well, it's awards time, ladies and gentlemen. Not all the awards or nominations have been announced, but a few things have trickled out here and there. You had the Pulitzer Prize about two weeks ago, and that went to August Osage County. Where, well, right. Tracy Letts, it goes to the author. Yeah. And um, a couple of other awards have announced, but here come some of the majors. The Outer Critics Circle nominations were announced last week. And you know what show got more nominations than any other? It's a Broadway show. Bit of a surprise considering that the critics weren't so was thrilled. Young yes, it was. Young Frankenstein got 10 Outer Critics Circle nominations. Well, Might not win any, and a lot of those nominations were in technical categories, but still, mm -hmm. that's, that's a surprising harbinger for a show that was viewed by pretty much the entire media and theater establishment as a disappointment. People are liking it, and they think it's big and fun and splashy and funny and musical, and you never know. You never know. It might uh, sneak up on people and, and get some wins. Anyway, South Pacific, the revival of that show, got eight nominations. And the show I saw this afternoon, Les Liaisons Dangereux, revival of that play, got nine nominations. Very uh, nice showing there. Anyway, how did the Thirty Nine Steps do? Did they get a lot of nominations? I don't have the list in front of me. Oh, I'm I don't sorry. know. I, I, if I did, I, I, I would let you know. I, kinda, I, I was wondering, because, you know, with its reopening and stuff. Oh, well, the, the fact that it's moving, that it was a yeah. big enough hit that it packed in enough audience members that the 39 Steps moved from one theater to another because they had to leave. The theater was booked, and now they're going to try and make a go of it. Well, it was, it was part of the repertory theater. company, and then they, someone else bought the rights to produce it. Cool. Cool. Excellent. So, anyway, um, the winners of the Alger Critics Circle no, um, Awards will be announced on May 12th. And then the ceremony is May 22nd at Sardi's Restaurant. Now, the Drama Desk nominations were announced as well. Uh, they're announced by B.B. Newirth and Len Cariou. And they, they also said that the cast of title of show is going to be performing at the Drama Desk ceremony on May 18th at LaGuardia High School. And, of course, the big news about the Drama Desk nominations, unfortunately, they were rather overshadowed by quote-unquote controversy about the drama desk. I don't know if you read about this in Michael no, Riegel's column in the New York Post. Um, someone left the drama desk nominating committee under not-so-pleasant circumstances. Really? Yeah, Who? Who? Fit. Who? A guy named Tony Phillips. I don't know him. Okay. Some writer for a gay magazine or two and a couple of other places. No, he did. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> no, he, no, he did not. And so he bitched to Michael Regal, who writes the New York Post column, or somehow Regal got wind of it, that uh, they lost a nominating member. And what happened? What, why? Well, because he was angry at one of the major people on the nominating committee, a woman named Barbara Siegel. And I know Barbara, and we all know Barbara. And so the vast majority of people who are Drama Desk members, myself included, and including the head of the Drama Desk and people like that, came totally out in her favor and said, who is this idiot and what's he complaining well, what about? what did he complain about? It has, to, it has to do with her making it sort of a personal fiefdom of how the rules are and the fact that she, she was, um, you know, there were, there were certain ways about how the nominations were done that weren't fair to everybody and the fact that, oh my God, that they were having all these meetings about the Drama Desk and they were going to a Chinese restaurant on the drama desk budget while they were arguing out you know, what the nomination should be. 
and that they were spending drama desk member money on their meals at this Chinese restaurant that was near Barbara's home. I mean, it was really pretty ludicrous stuff. And according to Michael, I don't think they should be eating on our dime. Yeah, I oh was. On, I, I know. I know. I, I was on the nominating committee of five years. Think you ago. should have thought, actually. And when you have, argue like that, and you're there for two, three, four hours, just going over show after show and thinking about them and saying what should be nominated, you gotta eat. Uh, but a little believe. Chinese food, man, don't begrudge. Yeah. I do believe that you were at the um, the a hotel when you did that, though. Weren't you doing it in the marquee? I remember we had one meal in a restaurant, and maybe there was no, another. No, but didn't you have meetings where you yelled and yelled for hours on end at the marquee? We had, I remember that last, that big one last meeting. We didn't yell and yell, but it was about three hours, three and a half hours, and we were exhausted by the end of it. And and, and again, it, no, none of these processes is perfect. The Tony nominating process and, and the voting process is far from perfect. They're incredible. Imperfections, uh, imperfections and slip-ups and things that, you know, people get a ballot in the mail and they have someone else fill it out and, and people vote for their friends or they vote for the things that they're producing. Right, of course. I mean, uh, no, I mean, there's not a purity here, even though we can aspire there's to There's not it. a purity anywhere. Right. So there isn't a purity in the drama desk either. And I, I remember when I was there that there would always be, you know, the reason that the drama desk would come up with sometimes these absurd nominees these these nominees where you wonder who saw these shows who even heard of these shows and let me tell you something when we get together the nominating committee and argue and talk about them we would sit there and look i don't remember this what when did this play and it played for three weeks on yes. alternating thursdays in a garage up in dumbo or down in dumbo but someone went to see it and loved it and what would happen was we would throw, if someone felt really, really strongly about it, we'd throw them a bone. We'd say, okay, this is your nomination. You really love it. You care about it. We don't, we don't have a clue, but we'll throw that in for right. all the work you've done. That's how it works. And that's how... Because you can't possibly see everything right. ever, that ever opened. But then again, people complain if there's too many shows that are all the obvious Broadway candidates. Because mm -hmm. that's the one that all everybody sees. So these little things that get the nomination, that's their reward right there. Because they're not going to win. So they say, we'll give it a nomination, and that'll be like it getting an award, because there's no way it can win. And also, sometimes doesn't Drama Desk give out like six, six, six nominees? Some, I think five. Right? Certainly they have five. They have five. Yeah. But I think sometimes they go six. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what the hell? Who cares? You know, it's a dumb little award. They all are. You know, be flexible. If, if there's great work in seven by seven people in a category, make seven. If mm -hmm. it's like a year when they had Sunset Boulevard, when there were no other musicals, and don't have any other category. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Remember Sunset Boulevard won all the categories because it was the only one in the category? <laughs> it happens. <laughs> you know. Speaking of which, one more award to mention is the Clayban Award for Most Promising Theater Lyricist has gone to David Lindsay Abair. Really? He won the Pulitzer last year for a play called Rabbit Hole. Now he's written the lyrics for Shrek which is a Broadway musical due this coming season. So, so how um, can he get it if it hasn't even opened? I know. Well, they, I, I guess somebody read the lyrics and liked them. Okay. <laughs> That's kind of weird. I know. I, it shouldn't be for something that hasn't really no. popped yet, you know? Whatever. Anyway, maybe the lyrics are wonderful. I hope so. Or maybe, ah, whatever. Things in development I'll need the awards, too. The lyrics, though... Uh, well, I guess they, they've already been out there. The lyrics to Crybaby were amazing. They were very, very funny. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to Crybaby I'm sorry, yeah, in yeah, a yeah, couple just, minutes, but they were very good. I know, lyrics. I know. I don't mean to do it, but yeah. I mean... But let, let's, let's go quickly through some of the other news of the week in Broadway, on Inside mm -hmm. Broadway. The Roundabout has announced its next two shows at its off-Broadway space, the Laurel yeah. Hell Theater. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, it's not really it's downtown space. This is off Broadway space. Sorry, did I say downtown? I'm I'm sorry. It's it's they're on also Forty Something Street, but it's not in their Broadway space. They're going to be doing a revival of David Rabe's play Streamers. It was one of his famous Vietnam trilogy yeah. of plays, like Sticks and Bones and The Basic Training and of Pablo Hummel. This is the other one, Streamers. Mm -hmm. um, it opens in November at the Laura Pell's Theater. And they're also doing a new comedy by Lisa Loomer called Distracted. And it features Cynthia Nixon of Sex and the City fame as a mom of a kid with ADHD. And she's trying to figure out how to deal with that. And that opens in February of 2009. And now, a little news 
Oh, I can oh, I can barely contain my shudder, especially since Rabbi Saul Solomon was just kind enough to be on our show a couple a few moments ago. The rabbi's nemesis uh-uh. has popped up again like a bad penny. <laughs> Mandy Patinkin has been Aww. is going to play Prospero in an off Broadway production of The Tempest at Classic Stage Company this fall. Ah uh, well. How will the how will the rabbi endure the appearance of Mandy off Broadway? I don't know. I think he'll have to go and, and get up and boo him. He's either that, yeah, or Mandy, you can still apologize anytime. The rabbi's waiting. Oh, he wants to hear from you. It, he does not deserve an apology. Excuse moi. Yes, I. Why not? Because it, Mandy was ex- it wasn't expecting it, and that's the problem. Oh, Mandy was oh, excuse me, Mandy well, was expecting. Well, he was expecting me. someone a little less. Rabbinical? <laughs> or, and, uh, uh, Ecumenical? Well, and a little more serious. Because uh, no. Mandy is a serious actor. Yes, yes, he's a serious man. And a jerk. So he needs to be taken down a peg. Yeah. Even though he's doing a lot of benefits now. He's doing a lot of charity stuff. So, you know, nice he's of him for that. He's a good guy. The ra- he's well, nuts. He's nuts. He, he hung up on the rabbi, so what? Well, it's, it's good to have the occasional radio feud. It's the one thing people talk about more than anything else. It's like okay, no, you can have a feud with him. I'm just, yeah. I'm taking the Patinkin point of view. Well, this is point counterpoint. Fair enough. No, this is inside Broadway. We're moving on to more Broadway news. <laughs> David, you ignorant slut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Manhattan Class Company is going to have a pleasant tomorrow. They've announced their lineup of off Broadway shows this coming season, including a new play by Michael Weller called Fifty Words. Oh, I'm so glad I like Michael Weller. Yep, and he was a guest on this program a few years ago. So, yay for Michael Weller! Yay, yay, um, Michael. Yeah, I don't know when. Go, Michael. Go, Michael. He wrote the book for Zhivago that was supposed to be coming to Broadway last season. I don't know what's happening with that. Anyway, The Break of Noon, another new play by the incredibly prolific Neil Labute. So, really? yeah, he's got a new play opening up right now, and then he's got a new show coming to Manhattan Class Company next year. And then a play by David Greenspan. Ooh, what did he I write? Don't. I've seen some solo work of his, but he's gotten better over the years. He's an actor, but also an avant-garde kind of oh, downtown okay. gay playwright. He's written a show called Coraline, a musical. And this is why I'm interested. The music is by Stefan Merritt, who is the lead singer and songwriter of a great band called The Magnetic Fields. Oh. So, kind of interested. Anyway, on Broadway tonight, opening is Boeing, Boeing. Boeing, oh, yeah. Boeing. It opens well, It's tomorrow. actually Boeing, Boeing, Boeing. Because the, the airplane. airplane manufacturer. Yeah. So, but I like to go Boeing, Boeing. Because it's how Everyone it's does. Boeing. Yeah. It stars Mark Rylance, Bradley Whitford, whom people remember from the West Wing, Christine Baranski, Gina Gershon, um, and Crossing Jordan's Catherine Hahn, making her Broadway debut. She, she, she's not the, the hot Jordan. She's like that red-headed girl who was chasing She was the his sister guy. Jessica Hahn. Something like that. No. But yeah. anyway. What? Catherine Hahn is a sister? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. I don't think so. I have to look that up. A little younger. I don't know. Well, anyway, um, at one point, Boeing Boeing was the longest running show in London history, written by a French Swiss playwright, but it had its greatest success in London's West End. Um, this production is going to be at the, is at the Long Acre Theater, and it's all about this guy who's having all these infidelities with three different stewardesses, or stewardi, how scandalous, and they all turn out to be in town on the same day. Damn. I love these kinds of things. I love a good farce. I hope it's good. I'm looking forward to seeing Boeing Boeing. The reviews will be out tomorrow because it opened tonight on Broadway. And if the, and if it's still open tomorrow, that means it's okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Opening right. on a Sunday is a tough. Is, is always that was always like a, a show that's like going to just flop in one day. Because because they have to because Monday they were usually dark and yeah. if they were to close it they and they close it and they end the week. Yeah, I don't think I think they'll give it a. Uh, I don't. I hope so. Well, the, the, actually, probably it's it's eleven fifty eight. I'll bet there are a couple of re- reviews up already about it because Variety will have filed, and probably the Associated Press would have filed, and then within an hour or two, the New York Times will be out. So it's out there. It opened already earlier this evening. Yeah, I'm but I, I'm just saying years ago. But but I I think I don't think this is, is going to be the same problem because um, they've had a very big revival in London. 
Oh, just last. You know, with well, that's the one. Yeah, they, yeah. And that's why they brought it over. Right. So anyway, before we go on with a little more inside Broadway, first of all, it's 11:59 p.m. on WGBB. Moving into May 5th now. So uh, five five oh seven. Oh eight, actually. Oh eight, oh eight. <laughs> Mr. Numbers Man, a year behind. <laughs> Oops. Want to tell everybody who's going to be waiting for gospel all night into the morning that uh, your engineer and DJ Ace, Ace. Forgot her name. I'm a little tired too. Ace has a flat on the highway. So if anyone is passing Ace, right? Please help her with the flat. If you're passing gas or passing Ace. Help her out on the highway. She'll be here a little late. So we're going to hold down the fort until Ace is here um, with bring her bringing you gospel. But until and then, please we'll, don't call and tell us, where's Ace? Where's yeah. Ace? Ace is on the highway. We'll keep repeating that. But until she comes back, we'll keep doing Dave's Gone By. Uh, and, and we'll keep you informed on how Ace is doing with her flat. Yeah. Well, if, if they keep us and informed. If, Ace, if you can hear us. Call us and tell us if you're back on the road. Well, I, I said if she's going to be later than 12:30, um, someone will call and let us know so we, we can plan accordingly. We'll probably start playing some gospel music or something like we did that time a few months ago. <laughs> that was fun, actually. Anyway, but before we give up on this news section of Inside Broadway, and since it is midnight now, let me remind people what I told them at the beginning of the show on June 14th. Tomorrow's another day. The fourth annual. WGBB Tony Award special starring me and Jeff and Michael Riedel, all co-hosting. Is it going to be well, Michael Riedel? What went on in that uh, that article? Well, yeah, he, oh, he's, he's dying to talk about that, but he talks about everything. Michael is no holds barred. He will tell Love the truth, it. and he, you know, he gets the real dirt. So it's going to be pretty, pretty fun. And with Even all the shows opening, to the post. I'm sorry. Even though he writes to the post. Why? Well, yeah, he's. he's the only thing, well, him and Phil Mushnick are the real reasons to read the Post. Everything else is, you know, the Post. Headless body and topless bar. Yeah. I should, well, okay, that's kind of a segue here, but the guy, one of the people who compiled a book of New York Post headlines called Headless Body and Topless Bar, because that's their most famous headline of all time, he's going to be a guest on Dave's Gone By in a week or two, Chris Shaw. Wow. And he's going to be talking about the, the book and some of the best headlines in the history of the New York Post. So just throw, I throw all that in there before I remind you again, June 14, 7.30 to 10 p.m., <laughs> the WGBB Tony Awards special. Gotta push it. Gotta tell everybody it's going to be on you, there. Gotta, gotta, gotta. Listen on the internet. Listen on your regular radio. There's going to be music from a lot of the great new shows on Broadway, like Xanadu and Young Frankenstein and hopefully Passing Strange and In the Heights. We have really cool prizes this year, including tickets to a show at the Broad Hollow Theater and a couple of packages with CDs and big booklets and, and and uh, giveaway things, and also the usual talking with other critics and with real Tony nominees, all June 14th, 7.30 to 10 on the Tony Awards special. Well, speaking of special, Jeff and I are going to be talking about some special shows that we've seen on Broadway the past week or so. Well, that's special. The past month or so, actually. Yeah, well, yeah. One or two of them have been waiting around a while for us to talk maybe about. Maybe put his pants on since it's gospel time. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. Yeah. Scratch? At least, at least it's cooler here in the studio than when I first walked in. It was like 90 degrees. Well, that's because I walked in and cool. You, you displaced all the air. There you go. That's, that's what happened. Uh, you're funny. We'll be back with more Inside Broadway right after this message. What's playing on Broadway? I'll tell you what's playing on Broadway, and I'll do it by checking Performing Arts Insider. Off Broadway, off, off Broadway, off, off, off Broadway. You keep adding offs, they'll keep adding listings. Who's in the cast? What's it about? Why is it special? Performing Arts Insider is Broadway the best way. 516-295-1511. 516-295-1511, or see PerformingArtsInsider.com. PerformingArtsInsider.com, as I said, like, it's a great place to get Performing Arts Insider to subscribe to it because Dave's Gone By listeners get a huge, huge discount. It's, it's about $60 off the regular price for a one-year, 12-issue subscription. So do check it out. You can either go to PerformingArtsInsider.com or get there through my website, davesgoneby.org. It's 12.03 a.m. on WGBB Freeport. We're also live streaming on the web at am1240wgbb.com. Gospel's running a bit late because they've got a flat tire, and I guess they're waiting for, uh, for Jesus to come and help. So until he does, 
know, if he can walk on water, I guess he can walk on a little bit of oil getting to the car and then help Ace out, because Ace is really cool and we like her, so she wanted to get, we want her to get here safe and sound. So until she does, uh, I know, that's, I, that's what I do. So Jeff is here, and we're doing a little more of Inside Broadway and talking about theater and reviewing some shows that we have seen, including... Wah, wah. Something in the park with George? <laughs> no, no. Cute, very cute. Try again. Wah, wah. Uh, what show could that possibly be? Um, kind of on audio but rhombus. But it has nothing to do with that. Rhombus. Really. No, 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 what, 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 what were those puzzles that people put together? So do like on concentration. No, where you, you put pictograms together to make words. Oh, yeah. Rebus, a Rebus puzzle. Is that audio what Rebus. Called, a Rebus puzzle? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, Cry uh, Baby. Cry Baby. Where? <laughs> which opened last week on Broadway. And it's based on, it's the second Broadway show based on a film by John Waters. It was kind of interesting. It was billed as creative consultant this time. Yeah. Well, the, the funniest thing about it is I remember seeing John Waters' films in college because I was old enough to see them. And back then, this was before he really crossed over into any. He hadn't done yes. polyester, he had not done hairspray, not done but he had baby. done pink flamingos. And female troubles. Uh, and, and desperate living. Oh, yeah. and, and things like that. Give me know. money. <laughs> and, and eat your makeup, I think, was another one. It was just like... No. Just women behind bars. I don't think that was one of them. Um, female troubles was about women behind bars. Oh, okay. But, <clears throat> I mean, to think... Just the way the culture sea changes. If there was ever a filmmaker who would never, in your wildest dreams, be the king of Broadway musicals, right, be the appropriate for adaptation of Broadway, it would have been John Waters. <laughs> Anybody, yeah, you could have said, oh well, maybe um, like Arthur Penn. Could they adapt Alice's Restaurant to a Broadway musical? Oh sure, maybe. Could they do Bonnie and Clyde? Well, yeah, why not? <clears throat> Martin Scorsese, could they do a Godfather musical? I hope they don't, but, you know, perhaps. The horror. <laughs> Peggy Sue got married? Perfectly acceptable idea for a musical. Uh -huh. Um, so, but no. John Waters, the man who has divine eating poo and Edith the Egg Lady in her cradle eating eggs. Uh, I'm telling you, well, you know, was Edith Massey was not Edith the Egg Lady. Yes, yeah, she was Edith the Egg Lady. Remember in that famous movie, she was Eggs Bad. Oh, yeah, I no, that eggs. was a character. That was a character. Oh, yeah. Well, but we called her Edith the Egg Lady because she was so magnificent. <laughs> but these are not the movies that are being made yet. I'm in fine for the Pink Flamingos. The musical. musical. The Filthiest Family Alive. <laughs> that one they'll do at the, at the New York International Fringe Festival if they do that at all. That, that would be amazing. But they did do... But well, they should do free, Female Troubles in Musical, don't you think? It would be, it would be amazing. I want money! <laughs> six people would see it, but those six people would love it to death and oh, see yeah. it over and over again. I don't know. I think it would be much more than six. I think people would... Really? <laughs> <laughs> I think Mark Shaman and, and uh, Scott... Was it Shaman and Wise? Sh well, Shaman, the hairspray people. Yeah, Shaman, Shaman and Scott. Oh, Clay, uh, no, oh I, know, I know who you're talking about. Or... Or maybe the guys who did You're in Town, Holman and Kogus, might be more uh, even more appropriate. Yeah, but, but I think I think Shaman, these two have the Waters sensibilities down pat. Well, do see the the one complaint that I read about Crybaby from the other critics before I, I saw it was that it's too generically musically cute and clean. It isn't John Watersy. It's oh, too it's very John Broadway y. No, it's very John Waters is not because fact, because what Cry Baby is is it's about what really was in 1954 I believe it was in Baltimore where they had the, the, these very big squares and they had it's it's Greece wasn't real at all it's, it's this is the reality of Greece which was these people were really really bad and and bad in a 50s way, which was not bad. Not bad, right, yeah. You know, so, and, and he himself, because I've seen him talk about this, because I too love John Waters. Yeah. And, and I've seen him talk about it, and he goes, bad was not like what we think of now as right. being bad. Bad was, you know, the girls got pregnant, and they, and, and the one, the, the, the one, the ugly girl. 
and you know, hatchet face, hatchet face. Hilar- what a hilarious character! Yeah, and, and that's a great makeup job because she is frightening looking. She really. Well, is. you first look at her, and go, what happened there? Right, yeah, it's intentional. And then they, I thought they would make her like a really pretty prom queen towards the end when she changes and gets plastic surgery. Uh-huh. Instead, no, they make her look like a divine kind of prom queen. That was a surprise. Yeah, to me. Uh, that was I, pretty funny. The, it's so clever, but this, this is what was real. As a matter of fact, I took one of my best friends who was a product of that same time. Uh-huh. And she goes, yeah, that really was what it was like. It was like, you know, the squares versus the... the drapes. The, 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 they were yeah. Drake. Was it Drake? No, in this it's the Drapes. With a P. Oh, yeah. oh, Drapes. Yeah. But and those are, that's actually the real real names of what the, the groups were. Oh, cool. From Waters of Time. This is a, it's all true, this. And that's what makes it even better, because... What what seems like square to us is being everything being happy, happy, happy. That's what the life really was. Well, or what what it wasn't what life was, but it was the appearance that people wanted to stamp. Well, onto that was life. well. That's that's this great character played by Harriet Harris. Har- mm. right? Harry Harris, yes. Yeah, who uh, who plays this woman who's all appearance and no reality whatsoever. <laughs> and and the the only problem they have is that everything it's such a fast moving musical yeah. it's it's hard to catch your breath in this and the one time it does slow down is a, a nice song by Harriet Harris, Harris where she did something wrong once yeah well it's an important song for that character and it's an important song for the development of the music but well, it wasn't I a great am... song and the the other problem was the the music was not as good as it was in Hairspray right the music in Hairspray you went into Hairspray and you came out of there thinking you'd heard it before because it was so familiar to you, yet it was totally new, and and you were just dancing. I remember dancing and, the, and the, just wanting to get up and dance at the end of the hairspray. Whereas Cry Baby, the music has also a familiar sound. It's, but it, it, I, I think it would take a couple more listens to really pick out a couple of songs that really stood out, rather than songs that that played and were good for the plot and, and had it, great lyrics, but you don't really see. Because well, what the I. I don't was what? Uh, with Mark Shaman and um, this other guy I can't remember. Right, Scott Shaman and Mark. Uh... Well, wait, wait. Actually, let, let's be clear. Um, for it's not the same team. No, as but hairspray. But they took the team of hairspray to write the book and the lyrics. Well, the book for Cry Baby is Mark O'Donnell and Thomas Meehan. Me and, of course, the guy who's also worked with Mel Brooks on right. Frankenstein and the producers. The songs in Cry Baby are by David Javerbaum and Adam Schlesinger. Oh, Schlesinger. Right, Schlesinger. wrong. Oh, I, I'm thinking it's... Right. right. It's not the same exact team. Oh, it's not at all the same team. Right. So that's why it's a different bunch of people. Yeah, I know. I knew the, the, the music was different. Yeah. So anyway, I'm, I like oh, I Cry Baby. I'm so corrected. I didn't even read the... Oh, I read everything wrong. Ooh. I did something wrong once. Yeah, no, you know, getting back to Har- Harriet Harris though, I'm getting a little tired of her doing that Harriet Harris shtick. Did you see Old Acquaintance on Broadway this year? Yeah. She she's turning into something of a she's a, a characterization character. of herself. Yeah, and I've seen her be wonderful, and it's like okay, pull back a little. She's not as funny in Cry Baby as she ought to be. I mean, not not every yeah, line that she no, plays golden, but I'm I'm like eh, she needs to get back to the person before she builds layer upon layer of just stick yeah but in the very beginning she it, it works so well with her where she welcomes everyone to the polio inoculation picnic yeah that, that that's the perfect um john watersy kind of opening scene uh-huh. it's the 50s everybody's bright and sunny and, and it's the polio picnic <laughs> and then a guy wheels out in an iron lung and, and they have the poster boy <laughs> The poster boy was little Jimmy in his iron lung. And I was thinking, when you get the first song working like that, it wasn't a thrilling first number, but the first number set the scene, worked, was smart, and then you knew right then and there it's, it was going to happen. I'm, I, I'm going to say that specifically because there's a show opening in a day or two where you know from the first song everything's going to be a disaster. <laughs> I'm not going to say it now because it's not fair to criticize a show that hasn't officially opened yet. But I'm just saying now. It, it, but boy, will it be criticized in a couple of days. Oh, yeah. But seeing that show a couple of days after Cry Baby just made me appreciate more. Yeah. Even though Cry Baby is kind of lightweight and maybe not as good as Hairspray and not as good as some other things, I don't think the book is as good as that show all shook up from a couple of years ago where they shoehorned all those Elvis songs into a farce based on Shakespeare. Yeah. 
It was called All Shook Up. And it was yeah, no, I remember. I really funny. liked it. Yeah. I liked it a lot. This has better songs and music. But uh, I know the book is cute and funny, but not in any way as clever or hilarious. Oh, I thought this one. was very clever. The book was so... The book and the lyrics are just out of this world in Cry Baby. I didn't think this, the, the music was much, I, but I also thought the direction and certainly the choreography was phenomenal. Do you think it might win or is in the... I think In the I, Heights is a lock for choreography, but... Why? Because In the Heights is very excitingly staged. That's true, too, and it's very different. But I, it's so weird because this is a very traditional choreography, and in the Heights is like freestyle. It's all that freestyle hip hop yeah. choreography. But they, it's all held together, though. I mean, you yeah. say it's freestyle, it makes it sound like it's chaotic. It's not. No. Yeah. So, but there's this marvelous. You, it's funny. The second act slows down a little bit, but the two really most exciting scenes are also in the, in the second act. They've got this jailhouse number. Uh, where you that then you really it really starts to cook. The rest of the time it's very pleasant, it's funny, it's amusing. But they have this jailhouse scene first of all because oh, I like the, I like the, the the what is it the turkey neck what was it turkey neck park or something? Oh yeah, no, there are a lot of good scenes, but I mean, something about that jailhouse scene is just oh that jailhouse up a notch. Is, oh my god, these poor dancers. You see them in the dance. The, the first the background, they're just doing a scene with the warden and they're talking, yeah. or or with a couple of characters, and the, the choruses. They're doing calisthenics. They're doing. They they're got, doing crunches. They're doing push-ups. License plates on the bottoms of their feet, and they're doing a tap. No, 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 that was during the escape. That oh, was, yeah. But before this, before they have like 20 minutes of dancing, they have like another 5 to 10 minutes of calisthenics on stage. Oh, actually, I'm going to get some 20 minutes. That's one of the good things about Crybaby. Uh, and I think about Hairspray, too. The one thing that it has, like a, say, a Susan Stroman show doesn't do is that Stroman always elongates the dance numbers. She always wants a 15, 10, 15 minute dance thing, be it from um, you know, contact her musical or or even the producers is over long because of too much dancing. She wants to show too much. So here they keep the dancing short and they keep it involved very specifically in you know as, as far as being geared towards the plot, moving things forward, and keeping the audience excited and keeping things going. And that's why it, it runs about two twenty. Instead of a Stroman musical that runs 245, it makes right. a big difference. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so thumbs up on Crybaby? Ab absolutely. Excellent show. Cool. Cool. Well, I agree completely. Gospel people are coming in here now, so we've got to close the show. After and we'll never get to talk about Sunday in the Park with, with George. George. Well, yeah, it's a shame. Well, we, we think a lot about Crybaby, but we liked it. Yeah. So, kind of neat. And I hope they'll send us the CD so we can play it on the television. And buy right tickets now. to Crybaby because it should last. It should run, you know. A lot of good things to see this season. I mean, but certainly better than there. something like curtains, which which is it's more thank, fun than curtains. Yeah. Thank God it's closing, but it, it, that did last a good year. Oh yeah. Well, I mean that's all David Hyde Pierce. He was just so good in that, and it's so fun to watch. I didn't even think it was that good. Oh well. Anyway, to be continued another time. Yes. Inside Broadway. We've just been inside Broadway. Thanks to TotalTheater.com and Performing Arts Insider. Oh, honey, make sweet love to me. Huh? Can't you put down that stupid book? In a minute, dear. You said that 20 minutes ago. What's so special about marriage, babies, and the end of the world? Well, it's a collection of plays by radio host Dave Lefkowitz. Why do you want to read a bunch of plays? Because they're hilarious. How'd you even buy that book? Online at davesgoneby.org. 20 bucks. And they've got trade paperbacks for 12 you would rather read Marriage, Babies, and the End of the World than ride me like a hot stallion? Well, maybe we can compromise. Wow, I love this book. <laughs> oh, and you too, hon. Hi, it's Eleanor Lisa. Yes, I do speak English. I do, I do. And when I do, I love to listen to Dave's Gone By. WGBB Freeport. Thank you, Eleanor Risa. Thank you so much for being part of Dave's Gone By tonight 